Okay, so this is the video for Lab 5 Colligative Properties, and we're going to talk about um, just overall what this lab is about, what you can expect, and go through some example calculations. Now, hopefully you've covered colligative properties in class already, um, but if not, colligative properties are just those that depend on the amount of something that is in solution and not the identity of something that's in the, the solution. And so when you talk about it in class, you'll go into vapor pressure and how um, having more of those solute particles in solution will really affect the vapor pressure of that pure solvent. You'll also get into freezing point and melt, uh, well, melting point is interchangeable. Um, freezing point depression or uh, boiling point elevation. Um, now, the big thing here is if it matters how many things are in solution, we have to consider whether something is ionizing or non-ionizing. Now, something that's non-ionizing, like, say, glucose um, or any organic or molecular compound, if you will, is going to stay intact. So C6H12O6 in water does not ionize. So once it's in water, it's still going to be this uh, relatively large molecule floating around. Meanwhile, something like NaCl will ionize in water. And so here you have Na plus and Cl minus. And so adding the same number of moles of this and this provide a different number of each type of molecule to solution. This would provide one, NaCl would provide two. Um, something like, uh, let's see, Na2SO4 from Chem 111, you should know that this is going to split into two sodium ions, and your polyatomic ion is going to stay intact. And so now we have two plus one is three solute molecules float or solutes floating around. Now, because we care about how many and not the identity, we have to take into account this factor of how many things are present. And so this is called the Van Hoff factor. So for us, um, this factor, or I, is going to be how many of our particles are in solution. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're working through the lab uh, this week. Now specifically, we're going to be focusing on freezing point depression. Now it turns out that if you have pure water, that solution is going to freeze at a specific temperature. It goes back and forth between, uh, let's go like that. Okay. Now at the freezing point, you technically have the ability to have both solid and liquid present. Um, that's why it's called the freezing point or melting point interchangeably. You have this equilibrium going on where some molecules are freezing, some molecules are melting, and it's kind of where the term ice cold comes from. Okay. Now, in general, uh, when we're talking about pure water, most of the time you can say it's going to freeze at zero degrees Celsius. That does have a little bit of uh, flexibility depending on if your thermometer is calibrated, which may or may not be the case in lab, um, and also depending on uh, humidity, uh, atmospheric pressure, and so on. There's a little bit of difference there. But we can say generally it's going to be in the vicinity of zero degrees. Now as soon as you start adding in solute here, this solute allows for more um, intermolecular interactions to be happening, and it makes it hard for the solution to solidify. And so in general, the solution is going to freeze at some lower 
um, temperature. So set maybe something like negative 1.3 degrees Celsius or something like that. Now, if you were to add a whole bunch of solute, you could get uh, a lot more of a decrease. Now, they actually use this all the time out on the roads. So whenever it's snowing and they have a freeze warning, um, or at least up north, sometimes we don't have the infrastructure down here, but whenever it's calling for snow or ice, generally you see the trucks out on the road that are going to um, be releasing rock salt. And um, that salt has a ton of uh, ionizing ability, and so you get a really good freezing point depression. So then you have this salt on the road, and as the snow hits, it melts because it is dissolving into uh, the water, and so you have roads that are wet but not necessarily icy, which is good. And so basically we're going to be taking advantage of that in lab this week. So what you're going to do is first become comfortable with the fact that uh, you need to be able to measure freezing point without really being able to see it. And so you're going to have this apparatus where you're going to have this huge beaker, I think it's a 600 mil beaker, and you're going to fill it about halfway with ice. Now, if you've ever tried to stick something straight into ice, it's really not that easy. And so what you're going to do is you're going to add water to just the top or just below the top of that ice. Then it's going to give you kind of a nice slurry effect and it'll be a little bit easier to stick a test tube down in there. Now, um, after that, you're also going to add about 30 grams of salt. Now that salt is not going to have any impact whatsoever on your actual experiment. But what it does is instead of allowing it to sit at zero degrees, it actually is going to lower the temperature of this to, um, uh, I forget what it was last semester, maybe negative 30 degrees Celsius. And so with that in mind, um, it, it, it allows for the rest of the experiment to work. Now, then what you're going to do We'll go like that, is you are going to then take your test tube, and you have this really huge one actually this time, and you are going to have a stirring rod, which is actually not really a stirring rod, it looks more like a um, spoon of some sort, like a ladle. And you're also going to have a temperature probe. Now, in uh, your diagram on the lab, it also shows that you're supposed to be able to have this uh, all capped up. And to be entirely honest, this uh, stopper probably won't fit. Okay, so just kind of be aware of that. Now, um, you're going to have this guy clamped to your ring stand so that you don't have to really spend a lot of time holding it. And you're going to add about 12 milliliters of water. And you're going to put it in here. Now you want the level of this liquid to be below the level of the ice here. It kind of ensures a that this all of this water is at the same temperature. It ensures you're going to get a really good experimental reading, OK? So you're going to stir this as much as you can with this without trying to or without hitting the temperature probe. And so it's kind of going to be just shaken up and down. Um, it's not really that uh, precise, shall we say. And you're going to monitor the temperature using the logger pro. Um, as soon as you get um, temperature versus time, as soon as you get a couple of readings that are exactly the same, this is your freezing point. So you're going to stir and kind of keep the uh, 
the th experiment going until you get three or four readings that are the same. And that is your freezing point of the pure solvent. And if you get a really odd measurement, a really odd number, your instructor may ask you to do that again, but it's not really calling uh, for, for that in your procedure this time. Then you're going to do the exact same thing where you have about, uh, well, actually, let's talk about this first. So you're going to pull this up. You're going to graph. Make sure you have a nice, pretty graph before you move on. At that point, your water should have thawed out. Now, generally, about this time, a lot of this ice has started to melt. Well, at that point, you're not going to have really low temperature in Celsius, which means you're not going to get your solution to freeze, which could take you a long time. So to kind of make sure uh, you are going to get a really good and really fast measurement, you're going to pour out all of the water, leaving the ice, guys, leave the ice, pour out the water here, add in a little bit more ice if it's a little bit less than half full, and then you're going to add about 20 grams of NaCl. Again, um, the point of the NaCl is not to affect your measurement, it's to keep this ice bath cold enough that you can obtain your measurement elsewhere, okay? Now, you're going to be doing the next part of the experiment both with a non-ionizing and with an ionizing uh, solute. The idea is non-ionizing is something like glucose, which is going to have a Van't Hoff factor of 1. Ionizing is either going to be 2 or 3. Ask your lab instructor which one you're going to be using this uh, week. Usually they go with the two, but you, you really just want to make sure you know what, you're, what number to use. Now, once you have your water and your solute, you go back in, you put it into this ice bath, and you stir it again until you get a nice set of data points. And there's going to be a difference here. And so that's going to give you your delta T. You have the Van Hoff factor of your pure solvent um, minus this of your solution. Now, guys, for us, this is going to be a negative number. Something like 0 minus a negative is going to give you a positive difference. You have to have a positive difference because you can't have a negative number of moles or something like that. Now, in addition, uh, you will have measured out the grams of your solute, so you'll have that. <coughs> so if you have your delta T and you have the grams of this, delta T equals KFM. Um, you can do all kinds of analysis here. So your delta T is the change in freezing point. Your KF is a constant that comes from that table in your pre-lab. Uh, so, for example, for water, which is what we're going to be using, it's 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. And then this is the molality, which is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Okay. Oops. So, here you have the grams of your solute because you're going to weigh it out. You also have the grams of your solvent. because you're weighing that out. This constant comes from the table, and your delta T comes from that, uh, the temperature in part um, A, and the temperature in part either B or C, depending on which section you're in. So what you can do with this is you can find the molality of the solution. You can then change into moles. You can find the molar mass of your solute. And if you had a a series of unknowns, you could actually determine which one it actually is. So let's look at how um, the problem is going to work. So this is kind of similar to the problem you see in your pre-lab, and I just want to show you how to work it in case you haven't um, gotten this far in lecture yet. Now guys, I have changed all the numbers. I'm not doing your work for you. I'm giving you an example. 
So you determine that water freezes at 0 0.30 degrees Celsius, according to your thermometer. Um, you add 0. Point, no, go away. 899 grams of non-ionizing solute to 11.021 grams of water. And the freezing point goes down to negative 3.21 degrees Celsius. The Kf of water is this. Let's find the molality. And again, remember that this is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Okay. Now our equation here is delta T is equal to Kfm. So we've got our delta T. We know that originally it was 0 0.30 and it went down to negative 3.21 degrees Celsius. Our Kf is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal and we don't know our molality yet. So at this point, we can go ahead and plug in and solve. So 0.3 minus 3.21 is, or minus the negative there, is 2.91 degrees Celsius equals 1.86 degrees Celsius per molality, times molality. So we can divide both sides by that 1.86. And I'm going to come over here for a second. And that just gives us um, 1.5, oops, 6 equals molality. Now if you check, this is degrees Celsius, this is degrees Celsius per molal. Celsius cancels 1 over 1 over this gives you that, just uh, the units of M. So this is mole solute per kilogram solvent. So that's our molality, okay? If we wanted to, we could go a step further and find the number of moles. Now, the way we do that is we're going to take and try and cancel the kilograms of solvent. Well, we know we have 11.21 grams. We need it to be kilograms. So we're going to come down here and say 11.021 grams. Converting to kilograms, we're going to divide by 1,000 grams to get 1 kilogram. Gives us 0 0.01121 kilograms of water. At that point, we can cancel kilograms. We have um, run out of room. Let's go with orange. Um, 1.56 mole solute per kilogram solvent. And then we know we have 0 0.01121 kilograms of solvent. And that is going to give us 1.56 times 0 0.01121. It gives us 0 0.0175 moles, and that's of our solute. Now, we could go a step further and even find the molar mass of our unknown. We have the grams of our unknown, and we have the moles of our unknown. So we're just going to pick grams over moles. Let's change our color again. And that is going to be 0 0.899 grams over 0 0.0175 moles, or 51.4 grams per mole. And so we now have our molar mass. And that's something pretty close to um, NaCl or similar. Now, that's how this works for a non-ionizing. And I should have mentioned but down here, you have an I. It's an understood one for a non-ionizing substance. 
but when you're doing the ionizing compounds, that Van Hoff factor isn't going to be a 1. It's going to be a 2 or a 3 or something completely different. And if you have this number different throughout this calculation, it's going to give you half as many moles or a third as many moles, which is going to um, change your molar mass substantially. And I'll tell you guys, um, on the pre-lab, you need to plug in and do the exact question that they ask you to do because if you just make an assumption without doing the calculation, you're going to get that question wrong. So when it's asking you how the molar mass is going to be affected, do the same calculation you do in number one by plugging in a two here instead of a, a one, just to see what happens. Now, um, this is how your math works. It's how your entire table goes through, honestly. So this should be a good indication of what the lab will look like and roughly what you're going to see. And I'm not going to do uh, anything, any more calculations with a different eye. I think that that was substantial um, enough. Um, make sure when you are doing this lab, you are really careful about not getting any salt or any contaminants in your test tube. Make sure your test tube <coughs> is clean and dry and make sure you're stirring constantly. Those are the problems we see most. And then finally when you're graphing make sure that your test tube is out of that water or excuse me out of that ice bath because if you don't you're just going to be waiting around for a long time waiting for that sucker to thaw and you don't want to be there any longer than you need to be. I hope this helps.